welcome to everyone this morning. And if you're a guest with us this morning, we are so glad to have you in service with us today. Thank you for being here. It is our prayer that you are touched by the presence of the Lord today and that you receive whatever God has for you today. Those that are joining us online, we welcome you as a part of this service to all of those that are a part of this congregation and unable to be here today. We pray for you that God would meet whatever your need is in Jesus' name. Praise God. I want to read from two different places in the book of Ezekiel as we begin here this morning. The first one is going to be Ezekiel chapter 11 and verse number 19. Ezekiel 11 and verse number 19. And I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit. Somebody say a new spirit. Within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh, and I will give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep mine ordinances and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And You have to understand that there are times in Scripture where flesh is referenced in a in a negative sense, our flesh that, that wants to be in control, wants to be in charge. But in this passage here, when he says, I'm going to take out your stony heart and I'm going to put within you a heart of flesh, that's a, that's a positive statement. He said, I'm going, to, I'm going to take out the hard heart. Sometimes because of what we go through and the situations we deal with in life, our, our hearts can, can become hardened. And so what he's saying is, I, I want to give you a tender heart. And then Ezekiel chapter 36, Ezekiel 36, beginning with verse number 24, Scripture says, For I will take you from among the heathen, and gather you out of all countries, and will bring you into your own land. That, that's kind of representative of the church. This morning here we have all kinds of diversity, not just culturally or ethnically, but we've got financial diversity. We've got educational diversity. And, and he says, I'm, I'm going to take you from all different places, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you your, your, your own land. I believe it's through the Apostle Peter. The Scripture says that you who are not a people, you who were not a people, are now the people of God. I'm going to bring you into your own land. Then he says this, verse 25, I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. I want to preach to you for a little bit today on the Holy Ghost. He said, I will put my spirit in you. I'm not just going to be with you. I want to be in you. Father, thank you for your presence that we feel in this place today. Your spirit already working and moving. Thank you once again that as we have worshipped you, we have entered into your presence with praise and worship with our singing and you have responded I thank you for that. I believe, God, that you've already done great things in this service as we have prayed for needs here this morning. I believe you have already met needs here today. But I also know and believe you are not finished with what you want to do here today. 
And so, God, I pray that your spirit would speak to us, that you would minister through your word today, that you would give us hearts that are open to hear and receive what you would say. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, I trust you again today. I depend on you this morning. I acknowledge that without you I can do nothing, Lord. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. In a couple of the verses we read, he said, I'm going to put a new spirit in you. But in that last verse that we read, he says, I'm going to put my spirit in you. I feel like before I proceed this morning with the focus of this message, I just need to take a moment and perhaps even for a guest here, just just explain something. I don't want to get too distracted or too bogged down with it, but I feel like to, to move on in this message, it is important for you to understand something, and especially if... You've been raised in Christianity, but maybe this is your first time in an apostolic church. Uh, We readily acknowledge there's a lot of things different about us. There's a lot of things we do differently. And um, one of the things this morning is we've been a little calmer than normal. And you'll, you'll see people do all kinds of crazy things sometimes and, and, uh, I believe we can, we can show you in Scripture the basis for it, and that's what matters. It doesn't matter what all the other churches or religions do. What matters is what, what does the Bible say? Because the Bible is the source. It's the way. It's the truth. It's the life. It's, it's what everything... We don't measure God by our ways, our ideas, our concepts. We, we measure all of this by the Word of God. What does the Word say? And, and so one of the things that separates us from much of Christianity is, is the, the, the belief that we have when it comes to the Godhead. What is really interesting to me, and if you've never done it, I would challenge you to do it. All it takes is a simple Google search. And without much effort, you can find out that the idea of the Trinity was a man-made idea. And that that man-made idea didn't even really get established until several hundred years after Jesus and the apostles had lived. I will read to you one simple couple of sentences from uh, Britannica website, which is a part of the Encyclopedia Britannica, and it says this, Neither the word Trinity nor the explicit doctrine appears in the New Testament, nor did Jesus and his followers intend to contradict the Shema in the Hebrew Scriptures. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. We, we don't believe that the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost are three separate, distinct, co-equal persons. We believe that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are three manifestations of one God, the same God. So here, here is the challenge that we have. The problem is, if I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times in my ministry. Well, well what about this verse or what about that verse? Let, let, me, let me read one more time. The encyclopedia says that the disciples or, or Jesus and his followers, which are called disciples, they, 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 they weren't going to believe something that would contradict Scripture. And they knew and their faith was built on the fact that, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, you, you got to understand that the context of when that was said had nothing to do with the Trinity. When the Lord told the children of Israel through Moses, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. There's only one God. That was based on the fact that all of the nations that surrounded the children of Israel all believed in multiple gods. And so when he tells them there's only one God, 
it was separating them from all of the other nations around them. If, if you want to establish your beliefs based on what the majority believes, most of the time you're going to end up believing the wrong thing. Numbers are not what validates truth. God intentionally chose a small group of people, the children of Israel, a very small nation to be His people because He was demonstrating that when it came to His church, His church would not be the majority. And so, so here's the challenge that we face. So we, 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 I, and again, I, I don't want to get too bogged down in this, but some of you need to hopefully have a little bit of a different understanding because I'm not, and I don't mean this uh, facetiously, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, but I have not come this morning to preach to you about the third person in the Trinity. Ezekiel, the Lord said in the book of Ezekiel, through the prophet Ezekiel, the prophecy was, I'm going to put my spirit, my spirit in you. So, so here's, the, here's the challenge that you and I have. I, I'm going I'm to need a little help. Brother Johnson, will you come stand right here? So, so uh, Brother, Brother Johnson is going to represent the, the, the Bible, the Word of God, okay? This is the this, this he represents the word of God, Genesis to Revelation, everything that's written in there. Brother Bray, I hope you'll forgive me for this, but I need you to come help me. <laughs> brother Brother Bray is going to he he represents the Trinity. Sorry, Brother Bray. <laughs> I, please hear me. I'm, I'm not trying to be facetious, unkind, whatever this morning, so please. So, so he represents the Trinity. So based on what I just read to you from what the, the Britannica said, the disciples lived during the time of the Word of God. And so anything that they referred to in the past went back to Deuteronomy. So therefore, they weren't trying, they had no need to interpret Scripture based on the Trinity. They they weren't thinking, well, how do you explain this verse? The problem is, you and I, we live here. And just about every one of us, I was born and raised as an apostolic, and I still find myself doing this. When we read the Word of God, we read it through So therefore, we, inter- we try to interpret what we read in Scripture by something that was created after Scripture. So really, I'm, I'm not prepared to because I, I, I think you can explain the oneness of God throughout the Scripture. So, but the bottom line is this: we shouldn't have to try to explain. Have to have. We shouldn't have to explain all these different verses in the Bible. Well, what about this in regard to the Trinity? When that was said, nobody was trying to figure out. So on the day that John baptized Jesus. And John said, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove. And then he hears this voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. John had no trinity to think that that was confirming. You and I, in 2023, when we go to read those verses, we're looking at it through a filter. Well, what about this? Well, what about again? You can explain it. I mean, that's. I think God let all of this happen intentionally. So you and I, again, even as ap- I, 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 as apostolics that have been apostolics for years and years and years, and people say stuff to you, and you still get that. There, there, there was. Peter, James, John, they, they, they didn't have to look through that filter. Thank you, brother. 
I, 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 I don't know if this is going to be a great analogy, illustration or not, but we're going to give it a try anyway. These are my readers. These aren't my real glasses. Everything is purple. That's a nice purple shirt you got on there this morning. Welcome home, Brother Tommy. We missed you. Tatiana, I like your purple shirt, too. What's, what the problem is, I, I'm, I'm looking through a filter. If I'm trying to interpret everything I read in Scripture based on this filter, I might get confused. If I take off the filter, I see clearly. I see, I see things clearly. I've had my own personal discussions with people. They want to they want to argue. And I, I've had people even acknowledge, well, I know that, you know, it was this doctrine was created 300 years out, but what do you mean, but? Didn't didn't the scripture say you got to be careful of those that add to or take away from the word of God? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. So, so part of the preacher, why, why, why is all this important I'm based on the Holy Ghost this morning? Because part of what I want you to get this morning is if you get the Holy Ghost, if you receive the Holy Ghost, you're not getting the third person of the Trinity and the Father is still up in heaven. When you get the Holy Ghost... When you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you're getting filled with the same one that in Genesis said, let there be light and there was light. The same one that spoke the world into existence. I'm not getting a portion or a part of God. I'm getting the Spirit. He said, I'm going to put my Spirit in you. I'm not, let me just let me just try to make a few more points here and then get to what I believe the message is this morning. You say, well, God the Father. You realize if you, if you God the Father was not the Father of Jesus. Because according to the scripture, the Holy Ghost. overshadowed Mary and she conceived as a result of the she didn't conceive as a result of the father she re, she 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 conceived as a result of the holy ghost so that makes the holy ghost Jesus father unless you just simply believe that the father the son and the holy ghost are just different manifestations of one god Again, I'm not trying to be unkind. Please, I really am not trying to be unkind. But I've listened to people, very sincere believers, pray that believe in the Trinity. And I've listened to them pray and they have trouble praying because it's like, which, which one am I, should I be talking to right now? And the bottom line is the Holy Ghost gets slighted a whole lot. Because the Father and Jesus usually get the attention. And the Holy Ghost is never really talked to. But if you understand all three are one, I'm not trying to. Sometimes when I pray, I use the term Father. Not because I'm talking to the first person in the Trinity, but what I'm doing by that, Jesus says, when you pray, pray this way, our Father who art in heaven, because what that is, it's establishing a relationship. He doesn't want you to look at him as some God way up in heaven, this, this, you know, this, this, this dictator or this tyrant. He's, uh, I want you to acknowledge me that as your father, and if you know what a good father is like, then when you pray, you can expect me to be a good father to you. I told this story before, but I believe it was early 2000s for several years. My dad, who was the founding pastor of this church, did it uh, once, and then he turned it over to me And uh, at, at the Severn School in Severna Park. They had an eighth, gr- eighth grade class that was religious, a religious studies class. And they would, they would uh, 
invite throughout the uh, semester, each semester in the year, they would invite clergy from all kinds of different backgrounds, all kinds of different religions, not just Christianity. And it was you would go and you had two classes, two different classes of eighth graders back to back that you could, you were there to share with them what you believe. Did you hear what I said? You were there to openly share with them what you believe. So I would go through and what, what it means is that to be an apostolic, a Pentecostal, what does that mean? What do we believe? And so I would always touch on this. There's, there's something that separates us a little bit from a lot of other Christians, and I would explain that we believe that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost are not three separate co-equal persons, but it's, it's the manifestation of three separate gods. And I promise you, every single time I would do, what, what, what age is eighth graders typically? 13, 13, 14. You would sit and watch these 13 and 14 year olds as you could almost visibly see the light bulb go off. And I would always give them the analogy that is oftentimes the go to analogy, and that is as I stand before you today, I am a son, I am a husband, I am also a father. How many people am I? What I do as a father, or excuse me, as a son, is very different than the things I do as a husband, and very different than the things I do as, I'm getting confused, <laughs> father, yeah. But I'm, I'm only one person, and the thing that was amazing is they would, they would, uh, they would have a student Every single time, so it was basically four times every school year, they would have a student that was responsible for kind of take, leading you in, taking you out, introducing you, whatever. And they would all, those students would send a, a, a thank you note. And almost without fail, in that note would be mentioned specifically. That thing you said about God only being one, I'd never heard that before, but that really makes a lot of sense. So, if you got questions about all of that, and you, I, I'm happy, or there's others that are happy to sit down with you and talk about that. So let's let's get back to the to the message. He said, "I'm going to put my spirit within you. I'm going to put my spirit within you." In John chapter 14 and verse number. 16, Jesus says this, and I will pray. I'm, I'm in acknowledge as I read these next couple of verses. Some of you are going to be struggling with what it says based on what I was just saying. Wait a minute, there's Jesus, and then there's the Father, and then, and then he's going to talk about the Comforter. So there, we got all three. Again, that's because you and I are looking through a lens. According to the Encyclopedia Britannica, they were not standing there listening to Jesus as he's speaking these words going, oh, you are confirming the Trinity. They weren't doing that. They weren't confused by that. They weren't looking through that lens. It was all clear. Jesus says, I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him for he dwelleth with you. But he's not just going to dwell with you, he's going to dwell in you. The children of Israel, when that tabernacle was built and the Ark of the Covenant was there, they had God with them. But God's ultimate goal was not to just be with His people. God's ultimate goal was to be in His people. I will not leave you comfortless. comfortless. Watch this. This is Jesus in the flesh speaking. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. 
Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but you see me because I live. You shall also live. At that day he shall, ye shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Again, if Jesus is just the second person of the Trinity, how can he be saying he's in us when he's saying, God said in the Old Testament, I'm going to put my spirit in you. Then according to that, that must mean you and I get the Holy Spirit and we get Jesus in us. Or do we just get Jesus in us? Verse 26. But the comforter, not a comforter, the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So back, I, I, I'm trying to leave it alone. I really am. Back to this co-equal thing. He said, Jesus, Jesus says, the Father will send in my name. That doesn't, if you're talking about a trinity, that doesn't sound like co-equality. If I, if I come up to you, and you and I are co-equal, and I tell you to go do something, depending on what it is, there's a chance you're going to look back at me and probably not even say anything. Looks will probably say it all. Excuse me? Do what? Go take your own trash out. When I tell one of my kids when they were younger, now the two boys that are still at home learning to treat them, to all of you that have little kids, enjoy it. The early years are physically demanding. The later years are mentally demanding. (laughs) So, you know, we're trying to treat the almost 23-year-old and the almost 20-year-old as young men. But you know what? There are still some times. I want one of you to go unload the dishwasher because I'm the father and you're the son. If one sends another one, if one has the authority to send another one, they're not equal. And also, one more, and I'll try to move on here. The most, to me, the most notable verse, the most known verse in the Bible by anyone, non-Christians and Christians alike, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. My, uh, my, my two biological sons are not here today, so Jalen is my son-in-law. Let me borrow you, Jalen. Come here. If, 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 you, if you needed a kidney transplant, See, y'all know where I'm going, don't you? And I said, I am so concerned about your need for a kidney transplant. I want to help you out. I'm going to get my son-in-law to give his kidney. How impressed would you be with my love for you? I'm not trying to be facetious, folks. I'm just telling you, it's really not that complicated. 
I'm not all that impressed with a God who's willing to sit up on his throne in heaven without any suffering and tell his son, you go down and suffer for them because I love them so much. But you know what? I'll take a God who is the creator of all of this and decided I'm going to robe myself in flesh and I'm going to walk among those I created and I'm going to hang on a cross and suffer to take away the sins of a world that I created that shouldn't be a sinful world I'll take that kind of God and I'll take that God living on the inside of me I'm going to send the comforter which is the Holy Ghost the Greek word for comforter means this it means summoned or called to one side especially called to one's aid It means one who pleads another's case before a judge, a pleader, a counsel for defense, a legal assistant, an advocate. It is one who pleads another's case with one, an intercessor. And in the widest sense, here it is. Here's what the Holy Ghost is. It is a helper. It is a succorer. It is an aider. It is an assistant. It is whatever you need. The Lord said to Abraham, or excuse me, to Moses, when Moses said, who am I going to tell them has sent me? He said, you tell them the I am that I am has sent you. Whatever you need me to be that's what I am can I tell you today if you've got the Holy Ghost if you need peace the I am is on the inside of you and you can have peace if you've got sickness you've got the I am who is a healer whatever it is you have need of when you've got the comforter on the inside of you whatever it is you have need of you've got what you need in the Holy Ghost Come alongside. Help strengthen. When I don't know how I'm going to make it through, I got the Holy Ghost. When I don't know how I'm going to face another day, I got the Holy Ghost. When I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't just have God with me like the shepherd said. I've got God in me and he's going to make a way when there seems to be no way. I'm going to stop trying, and I'm just going to say whatever I think the Lord given me to say. So, wait, wait, come on, what's the, what's the big deal, Pastor? And, 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 you know, Jesus himself said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. I know, I know, <laughs> not to throw my boys under the bus, but I forget which one of them it was. It may have been both of them in different situations, but they needed to write a check. They needed to write a check. What adult doesn't know how to write a check? Just a couple of months ago, one of them had to write a check. We had to give a tutorial on how to write a check. Never written a check. Don't even have checks. So to all of us old timers, of course, obviously, Credit cards, you still do this some, not every place anymore. But if you were to if you were going to write a check, or let's say you're using the credit card and they hand you the receipt because they want you to sign it, and you simply put on the ne- on the line where it says name, you simply put husband. Go ahead and try that and walk out the door. See what happens. Excuse me, sir. What's the problem? I I need your name. I'm not interested in just who you are. I'm not interested in what you do based on this title. I need your name. Go buy a house and try to sign the paperwork. Father, Father, Father. Sorry, not going to work. They need the name. 
That's why Jesus said, when Jesus said in Matthew to go and preach the gospel, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, that's why when Peter stood up on the first day of the church and in response to a question that said, what are we supposed to do? He said, here's what you need to do. First of all, you need to repent of your sins. And that's not just telling God, my bad, I did a few things wrong. Repentance is a change of heart, a change of mind, a change of direction. Repentance is, I've been living my life for myself, my own will, my own desires, but I want to turn from that and I want to live my life according to your will, your word, your desires. So you got to repent and then you got to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission, the forgiveness of sins. How did Peter say to be baptized? He said in the name of Jesus. So therefore Peter misquoted misapplied what Jesus said. Absolutely not. And in fact, it's no coincidence that Peter is the one that Jesus gave the keys to the kingdom to. So when the guy that has the keys to the kingdom in his pocket stands up and says, here's what you got to do, I'm pretty sure he's telling you what you need to do and that's what you need to do. So he said, be baptized in the name of Jesus. What Peter was doing was demonstrating the application of what Jesus said. And you shall receive. You shall receive. And I love what Peter calls it in Acts 2.38. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Do you have to earn a gift? Do you have to become worthy of a gift? No, you just have to receive a gift. If you'll do the steps that Peter said, then there is the gift of the Holy Ghost that God wants to freely give to every individual. Oh, hallelujah. A little bit more here, just this idea of a comforter according to uh, Barnes Notes commentary. He says this, the word translated comforter is used in the New Testament five times. In four instances, it apply, it is applied to the Holy Spirit. In the other instance, it is applied to the Lord Jesus. So again, if we're going to stick with this idea of, of, of three separate co-equal, there's more than three actually. There's more than one advocate. There's there's more than one comforter here. Unless we believe that when it talks about the Holy Ghost, that's the same thing as talking about Jesus. In the other instance, it is applied to the Lord Jesus. 1 John 2, 1. We have an advocate, a comforter with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. It is used, therefore, only by John. The verb from which it is taken, the word comforter is taken, has many significations. Its proper meaning is to call one to us. Then to call one to aid us as an advocate in a court. Then to exhort or entreat, to pray or implore as an advocate does. And to comfort or console by suggesting reasons or arguments for consolation. The word comforter is frequently used by Greek writers to denote an advocate in court. One who intercedes, a monitor, a teacher, an assistant, a helper. It is somewhat difficult, therefore, to fix the precise meaning of the word. It may be translated either as advocate, monitor, teacher, helper. So which one is it? Yeah, some of you got it. A, B, C, or D. All of the above. In fact, I'll say it this way. All of the above and more. All of the above and more. Because again, whatever I need Him to be, that's what He is able to become. John chapter 14 and verse number 9 says this. Jesus saith unto him, I have, have I been so long time with you, and you have not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us The Father, the verses before, Philip asked the question, Jesus, show us the Father. I've had numerous times throughout the lives of my two sons, even in various stages. One time that stands out to mine, in in mine, Timothy was about 
four or five years old, I think, we were walking into the Annapolis Mall. He and I were walking into the mall together. I was holding him by the hand. And an absolute, complete stranger, never seen before, never seen again, says to me, to me as we are approaching each other, Well, you can't deny he's yours. You see pictures of Nathaniel now and pictures of me when I was his age. We look a lot alike. But walking into the mall that day with Timothy at, again, I think four or five years old, somewhere around that, and that stranger saying to me, you can't deny he's yours, there's a big difference between that and being able to say, if you've seen him, you've seen me. He may favor me, but if you've seen him, you have not automatically seen me. Jesus wasn't saying, if you've seen me, you've seen what favors. He's saying, when you've seen me, you've seen the visible manifestation of the Father. Verse number 10, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified. Glorified in the Son. Well, there it is, Pastor. You got all. Let me say it one more time, at least, probably another time. They weren't standing there that day going, okay, here's the doctrine of the Trinity. That wasn't even a thought in their minds. Their problem was they were going, wait a minute, you're claiming to be the Messiah. That's what their struggle was. Their struggle wasn't over the Godhead, it was over the fact we're not sure you're the one we've been looking for all this time. Whatsoever you ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you will ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Hold on a minute. What did you just say, Jesus? You were just saying you're with us, but you're going to be in us. I, notice, look at this, verse 18. Jesus speaking, I will not leave you comfortless. He didn't then go on to say, I will send the Holy Spirit. He said, I am coming to you. 2 Corinthians, uh, before I get there, Paul said in Colossians, I think it's chapter 2, in Him, in Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In the verse before that, he said, don't be, don't be messed up by the traditions of men. Don't let the teachings of man get you off track and off. Go back to the Word. What does the Word say? What does the Scripture say? What does the Scripture say without the filter? 2 Corinthians 4, verse number 6. If, if there's not some part of this, these next couple, at least one part of these next couple of verses that you, you can't relate to the need for, then you're not, you're not human. <laughs> you're an android. 2 Corinthians 4, verse number 6. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure. We have this treasure. What's the treasure? The Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, we have this treasure in earthen vessels. 
that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. The context of that verse in the day and time that you and I live in would be like this. We have this treasure in plastic bottles. We've got it in disposable plastic bottles. Anybody got a china cabinet at home? I, those feel like they were more some things of the past. But my mom has a china cabinet. Man, there's all kinds of stuff on the shelf in that china cabinet. There's little dainty little teacups on saucers. Crystal bowls. All this other thing. Do you know what is not in my mom's china cabinet? There are no plastic bottles. There are no paper cups. Because the value of those things is the vessel. It sits on display. No matter what is in it or is not in it, its value is the vessel. Most of those things never come out of that cabinet. Several years ago, she was getting her dining room repainted, and I helped out. You don't just go in there and pick up the china cabinet and move the china cabinet. Oh, no. I hope my mom's not watching right now, and I hope she doesn't watch in the future. You take all 5,000 pieces in that china cabinet. And you very delicately place them on the table. And once it is all emptied, you then move the cabinet. He didn't say, I'm putting this treasure in porcelain cups. He didn't say, I'm putting it in, in crystal glasses. He said, I'm putting it in earthen vessels. Because I don't want the value to be the container. I want the value to be the contents. If this was an empty bottle and I tried to sell it, I couldn't sell it for anything probably. Somebody probably just give me a dollar to get me to shut up. But that would be it. But I promise you right now, if I came across you in the desert and you'd been a day or two without anything to drink and I walked up with you with this water bottle and I said, hey, give me a thousand dollars if you got it and I'll give you the water. First of all, I know that's inhumane, not, not humane, but bear with me for the point of the... What kind of human being are you? Would you charge people in their moment for... That's not the point of... You'd give anything you could, everything you had, if the contents are what you need. You know what is so amazing? It doesn't matter what your net worth is. It doesn't matter what your 401k has. It doesn't matter what your portfolio has. It doesn't matter if you have or don't have a savings account. The interesting thing is this. We were all made from the dust of the earth. And when it's all over with, we're going back to the dust. The thing that gives us value is not what we're made from, not what we go through, but what's on the inside of us. And I'm here today to tell you, if you're an empty vessel that's looking for some value and worth, I've got your answer today because there is a treasure that is in this place that you can have. He goes on to say this, we are troubled on every side. Anybody ever feel that way? Anybody feel that way today? Man, everywhere I turn, I got trouble in my life. He said we're troubled on every side, but we're not distressed. Why am I not distressed? Because the treasure. The treasure says all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. When I'm looking at the trouble all around me, the treasure says he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The treasure says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because thou art with me. That's how I can be troubled on every side but not be in distressed we are perplexed I, you're either you're either living with your head in the sand 
or you have got to be perplexed. I am freshly perplexed every day with the stuff going on in this world. If you don't have Jesus and you're not in despair, you got a problem. You ought to be in despair. If you don't have Jesus, you probably should be on medication. And I'm not being facetious because I don't know how else you deal and cope. But Paul says that we may be perplexed, but when I've got this treasure, I'm not in despair. Song we used to sing sometimes says, I've got a feeling. Everything, everything is going to be all right. Persecuted, but not forsaken. And I love this last one. Those little saucers carefully, daintily took out of that cabinet. You, you got worried if you set them on the table and it fell over. Much less if you dropped it. Watch what, this, watch what this old plastic earthen bottle does. Still good. Cast down. Cast down. But I'm not shattered into a thousand pieces. Knocked down by circumstances in my life, but I'm not broken into pieces because I got something on the inside of me that holds it all together. When I ought to be falling apart, when I ought to be stressing and worrying about everything, I've got a treasure on the inside of me, and that treasure is what's going to keep me. Christianity is not about achieving some kind of pain-free, problem-free life. Absolutely not. The Bible says the rain falls on the just and the unjust. The difference is the fact the unjust have no faith and confidence in God in the midst of the storm. But those that have built on the right foundation, it doesn't matter what the storm is. It doesn't matter how crazy it is. They've got confidence God's going to make a way whether there seems to be a way or not. I finish... With this, Acts chapter 2, the fulfillment of what Jesus was saying about sending the Comforter, Acts chapter 2. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all, they all experienced the fulfillment of what Ezekiel prophesied. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there was a whole crowd of people gathered around seeing that going on. And then they say, what is it we need to do to get that? And I've already quoted it to you, but Peter said, all you got to do is repent of your sins and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission, the forgiveness of those sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You will receive the Comforter. You will know that the Comforter is now with you, and He will never leave you, and He will never forsake you. Acts 10 verse 45, Peter, read it later if you've never read it before, but Peter gets sent to Cornelius' house. And after declaring to him the good news of Jesus, the Bible says, And they of the circumcision which believed, that was the Jews, were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Hey, just, just, just by the way, if you, you know, if you want to leave church, to leave church. I don't mean just this church. If you want to leave church because of imperfect people, if you want to leave church because there's still so-called Christians that battle with prejudice and racism, then you need to get rid of your Bible. 
do you not read? Did you not understand what I just read? There were people that were supposed to be saved that didn't like the fact that the Gentiles were getting the same thing they got. I'm not justifying anything. I'm just telling you, as long as there's human beings in the church, which is what the church is made of, and if you're on the search for the perfect church, if you happen to find the perfect church, don't join it. Because if you're looking for the perfect church and you find the perfect church, the moment you become a member of it, it won't be the perfect church anymore. They were filled with the Holy How did they know that? For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, then answered Peter. Acts 19, verse 1, last passage. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you, not, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be a Holy Ghost. Isn't that amazing? What, what do you mean a Holy Ghost? I've heard, I, I just heard several weeks ago, I heard a man praying. I, I, not second hand, I heard this first hand, in person. A man praying, and, and, and in the course of his prayer, I don't remember the exact words that were said, but this was the gist of it. He, he said, and, and, and Jesus, you know, uh, you know, in light of that person that asked me the other day about what the purpose and the work of the Holy Spirit is, and I'm not really sure the answer to that yet. That's what they were saying. Holy Ghost. What's the, we ain't heard of a Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that you should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They didn't say, Well, we were already baptized. He said, oh, there's a different way we need to get baptized. Let's do it. And when Paul laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them. How did Paul know the Holy Ghost came on them? Not because they simply made some kind of a profession of faith. Not because they simply accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. But Paul said, that, but Paul, the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. In Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Ghost was poured out, they spoke with tongues. In Acts chapter 10, when he says the centurion received the Holy Ghost, they spoke with tongues. When the disciples of John received the Holy Ghost they spoke with tongues because it is the evidence it's the evidence evidence isn't it amazing in the natural there's things we would not accept without evidence why would you want something so important as, as your salvation to be based on no evidence If this is about my eternity, if this is about where my soul's going to be forever, I'd like to have some assurance. So here's the question. I've heard my dad say this so many times through my, my lifetime. So, preacher, are you telling me that I have to speak in tongues to go to heaven? Nope. I'm not. But I am telling you the only thing I see as a consistent evidence of you having the Holy Ghost is... You speak in tongues. Again, for those of you that maybe are new, first time or first couple of times, I just turned 51 years old in November. As I shared Thursday night, I just read at the Y the other day that I qualify for the Senior Olympics for pickleball. What in the world? I went from reading on the board, the whiteboard where it was written, I went from going, oh, wow, that's cool. They have a senior Olympic for pickleball. Maybe I'll do that one day. <laughs> to then reading that I am qualified today 
to play in the Senior Olympics for pickleball. What in the world? So 51 plus years old now. My parents came to Annapolis in 1970 to start this church. I was in church probably, I think, within the first week of my life. Been in church ever since. I've watched hundreds, if not thousands, of people in my lifetime receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I can basically say I've never seen two people experience be exactly alike similarities yes but exactly no because throughout my lifetime I've watched when people received the gift of the Holy Ghost the comforter came to dwell inside of them I watched as they began to speak in other tongues and they began to do it at the top of their lungs and they began to shake all over the place and jump up and down and if you were anywhere nearby you better get out of the way because you were about to get a right jab right hook whatever need some of Brother Tommy's Muay Thai defensive moves or something. (laughs) You better watch out. I mean just crazy. Like they were standing in a mud puddle and somebody handed them a live cord or stuck a live cord. Then I've watched basically the other extreme where people without any heart, without hardly any external movement, with very little volume, began to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The evidence of tongues began to flow out of them. They didn't shake. They didn't kick. They didn't scream. They didn't holler. One person didn't get a real Holy Ghost and the other person get a fake. One person didn't get a better model of the Holy Holy Ghost and the other one got a leftover Holy Ghost. My point is this, out of all, I've seen people when they got the Holy Ghost stand there and tears just stream down their face in thanksgiving and gratitude that God, you as the perfect Lamb of God, would be willing to come live inside of such a messed up vessel as I am. Been dirty and unclean and done so much wrong, but you're willing to come live inside of me and just stand with tears of joy and thanksgiving stream down their face. I've seen that happen. Then again, I've seen the people that have jumped up and down or that done all those crazy things. That's not the common thing common thing that we find in the book of Acts and the common thing that I've seen in 50 plus years of my life is speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives the evidence. I'm not going to leave you alone, he said. I'm going to send the Comforter. He's going to come alongside you He's going to be your aid. He's going to be your strength. He's going to be your support. He's going to lead you. He's going to guide you. He's going to strengthen you when you need it. If you don't have that in your life, that is what is available to you. I know some of you here today, you're you're clean, unmarred earthen vessels. And then others, you've been scraped and scratched and chipped and cracked. Some of you, your vessel is full of holes. <laughs> Amazing thing is, whatever you need Him to be, He can become. You got some voids in your life, the Comforter can fill it. You got some empty places in your heart, the Comforter. And fill it. I want you to, if you would, just where you're sitting, bow your head, close your eyes for a moment. Through the prophet Ezekiel, through the prophet Ezekiel, the Lord gives the news that there's coming a day. I'm not just going to be with my people, I'm not just going to be amongst my people, but I'm going to put my spirit in them. You and I have that privilege and opportunity today. If you would 
just for another moment, keep your head bowed and your eyes closed. I know there's some people in this room today that you've never experienced what I've preached about. Please understand, please understand, I'm not, I'm not at all saying, implying, I don't think or feel that that means you don't have some kind of a relationship with God. The Roman centurion had not experienced yet speaking in other tongues that Peter talked about, but he had such a relationship with God that, that, that his prayers had come up before a memorial before God. But like the disciples of John that I read to you about in the last passage I read, when there was more shown to them that was available, it wasn't taking away from what they had had or what they had done. It was just saying, you can, you can have some more. If you've never received the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues... I know to the natural mind it sounds crazy. I know to the natural mind it's not all logical. I understand that. But all I know is what the Scripture says and all I know is what I've experienced for myself and I've watched others experience. And that same experience can be yours here today. You can leave this place today with the assurance, the certainty that God isn't just with you and that's a wonderful thing. You can leave today with the assurance that God is in you. If you're here this morning and you've never had that experience, I know, I understand what I'm about to ask is a little bit uncomfortable, but I won't get into all the reasons, but I, there's, there's reasons for it. One of the simple ones is it just there needs to be a step of faith. If you've never had that experience today, would like to be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, I'm going to invite you to just get out of your seat and come stand at this altar right now. I believe there's also maybe some people here this morning, you've received the gift of the Holy Ghost, but it's been a while since you've had a really had a refreshing and a renewing of the Spirit of God flowing in and through you. It's, it's been a while since you've really had any kind of liberty in tongues and the Spirit of the Lord flowing freely through you. Can I invite you for a, to let the Lord give you a renewing and a refreshing here this morning? Just another moment if you just continue with your head bowed and your eyes closed. If I could get some folks to help me right now as well. There's a comforter. There's a comforter in this place that when you leave here today, that comforter wants to go with you and he wants to do it in such a way that there is no question or doubt in your mind that he's with you in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus father right now by the power of your spirit I pray God for any individual in this place today that's never experienced the infilling of your spirit that treasure, God, being poured into our hearts and lives. I pray, God, that you would let there be faith released right now to respond to your word. Lord, your word says that we're not benefited by your word unless we act on it with faith. So let faith be released today. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I, I really believe there's a few more people here this morning that especially in the category of God just renewing you and refreshing you today. Come on, if that's you, if that's what you need, would you just be willing to be a little bit vulnerable right now and just, just step out of your seat, make your way down to this altar as an acknowledgement. I've already had the Holy Ghost. I've already been filled, but I just... I need a refilling. I need a refreshing. I need a renewing. I need the reminder. I need the, reassur the assurance. I know that we ought to have faith in God simply based on His Word. I know we ought to have confidence. But the Scripture says He remembers our frame that we're made from the dust of the earth. And He understands when we go through doubts. He understands when we have struggles. He he understands when we've got questions that are bombarding our mind. He doesn't judge us for it. He doesn't, he, doesn't, 
doesn't scold us for it, but he, the Comforter, the Comforter comes alongside. The Comforter comes alongside again. Would you just let the Comforter come alongside you right now? Come on, even if you're not willing or comfortable to come to this altar right now, would you, would you just let the Comforter trust you, or touch you right now where you are? Let the Comforter meet you where you are right now. Oh, Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, it's not about a feeling. Some of you might be feeling something. Some of you may be feeling the presence of God, but what God is doing is not based upon a feeling. It's not dependent upon a feeling. It's based on faith. So whether you feel it or not, I can tell you the Holy Ghost is doing something in some lives in this place right now. Somebody's getting some help. Somebody's getting some strength. The Comforter is coming alongside some people right now. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, Lord. Thank you for the privilege of having your spirit put in me. Thank you for the privilege of your spirit being put in me, God. I'm just an earthen vessel. I acknowledge I'm just an earthen vessel. Thank you for the treasure. Thank you for the treasure. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I was broken and confused. Thank you for finding but me where I was. I was lost, but you found me. And your mercy in oh, pursuit. Thank you, Jesus. Was grace oh, thank you for grace. Me from the grave. Thank you for your mercy today, Lord. Thank you for your mercy today, it's Lord. Your blood that oh, thank you, Jesus. Such amazing grace, Jesus. Oh, with your amazing grace, you left heaven for my rescue. Face the darkness, defeated death for me. You left heaven for my rescue.
defeated death for me. People still praying. The Holy Ghost is still ministering. Whenever you need to go, you're welcome to go. Again, thank you for being here this morning. God bless you.